thanks you guys uh, for coming uh, today. And uh, I'm going to give a talk. Uh, yeah, it's a variant of a talk I've given before, but uh, I've, I have a lot of uh, updated examples because, of course, uh, we're constantly uh, developing new stuff. So uh, raise your hand, please, if uh, you are already familiar with uh, basically uh, radically open security and, and our story of pen testing chat ops. If you've ever heard me give a talk before, raise your hand. So that's one person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so most of you don't know. Uh, okay. That's cool. Raise your hand if you know about chat ops. That's okay. Uh, yeah. A quarter of the people. Raise your hand if you know something about security. Okay. That's almost everybody. <laughs> raise your hand if you would consider yourself a security expert. Okay, smaller number. Raise your hand if you are a penetration tester. Okay, <laughs> the same people. All right, cool. So, uh, great. So, first, I guess I'll tell you uh, a little bit of background on uh, sort of who I am and uh, what, well, part of why I'm actually here. So, I created a company called Radically Open Security. It's a not-for-profit computer security consultancy company. Uh, sounds a bit strange, but uh, the whole idea really is just uh, that, uh, well, I, I don't want to make this a business model talk, but we basically set ourselves up in a weird way uh, so that we uh, give all of our, give 90% of our profits to charity. That's the long and the short of it, uh, via something called the NLNet Foundation. Um, but what's actually more interesting, I think, is uh, we have a really strong commitment to openness and transparency. And one of the reasons why uh, I actually started Radically Open Security in the first place was because it always really used to piss me off uh, how security consultancy companies would essentially come in, be this incredibly opaque black box. <laughs> they would basically just say, back off, you know, we're going to solve everything for you, give you a report at the end, and then give you this, you know, ginormous bill, <laughs> you know, which works. But, you know, if you're a customer, of course, uh, you would actually rather learn and observe and, you know, really optimize for knowledge transfer. So I started Radically Open about three years ago with the express purpose of really trying to explode that inside out and really create some kind of alternative that was as open and transparent as possible to the customers to maximize for knowledge transfer. So that is actually one of the main purposes, as it were, you know, sort of uh, of our company, to really try and bring something disruptive sort of into the security industry so we can actually try and explode, not just ourselves, but our competitors as well, you know, into uh, being more open and being more transparent. So, but this um, actually has a lot of direct implications in our daily operations, uh, which, of course, you know, com comes to the whole chat up story, <laughs> which I'm going to be telling today. But, uh, so, we actually, as a security company, I would say that, uh, strangely enough, we're actually very much a DevOps shop. <laughs> Um, we really have, uh, we're running our own infrastructure. We use open source for pretty much everything. You know, we've written all kinds of different, uh, different hooks. Uh, you know, I, I have multiple people that are basically just working at this point now, sort of full time, just on, uh, on coding you know, and uh, in front DevOps work. So, and uh, yeah, stra strangely enough, that actually works incredibly well for security and penetration testing. So. Chat ops uh, is a concept that I originally learned about uh, two years ago at the uh, DevOps days uh, here in Amsterdam. And uh, GitHub, surprise, surprise, was uh, giving a talk <laughs> about it. And, you know, I listened to what they were saying about how they were doing their DevOps uh, via these chat bots, more specifically this chat bot called Hubot. And then I, I listened to that talk and I was like, this is it. <laughs> You know, because basically what I thought was that, you know, using a chatbot like Hubot, for example, that actually could have tons of applications for pen testing. <laughs> you know, and not just for pen testing, but actually for running, a, strangely enough, actually a traditional, a traditional kind of consultancy company. <laughs> you know, most people don't usually think that way, but I, I saw that and I immediately saw the application. Another thing also uh, about radically open security that makes chat up so appropriate is that we are a uh, completely online and globally distributed company. <laughs> so in that way, I mean, we're also very similar, I guess, to, you know, to, to GitHub and how they have also a, a whole bunch of personnel, uh, well, uh, personnel all over the place. And of course, it's also incredibly modern, <laughs> you know? It's sort of the, the business, you know, companies becoming, you know, platform organizations. You know, we're sort of doing that also 
with my security company. But of course, you know, working completely online has its own uh, unique set of uh, <laughs> challenges. And, uh, you know, essentially we use this platform uh, called Rocket Chat uh, as sort of our main hub for communications, uh, you know, with our staff. So Rocket Chat is nothing more than an open source, self-hosted version of Slack. Why don't we use Slack? You know, because there is no cloud, there's only other people's computers, and, you know, and I'm running a pen test company. So there's absolutely no way that we're going to let our customers pen test data, you know, off of our, <laughs> off of our own servers. So, but, you know, Rocket Chat uh, is actually a really great alternative for Slack. Uh, we're actually somewhat uh, close uh, with, uh, with the developers, have quite a bit of interaction, with, you know, with them, have pointed out a few bugs in their code, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and they, in turn, have actually been incredibly responsive. Uh, you know, it's, it's quite feature rich, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of integrations and plugins for it. And the best part is you have control over your own data. So, I mean, not to sound too unfriendly to Slack, but to be quite honest, I don't understand why people are still using it, <laughs> you know, given the usual business model. Because at some point, of course, they're probably going to get acquired by Google or Facebook, you know. <laughs> and, uh, well, that, that's what happens with your data, <laughs> with these kinds of free services. So, anyway, I don't know that for sure, of course, but I'm just speculating. But Anyway, but the point is, uh, so uh, we're using Rocket Chat uh, for uh, our chat. Uh, we're also using Hubot, uh, which was developed by uh, GitHub as our, uh, as our bot. So uh, we also have, uh, well, you can see, for example, now th this is actually a kind of generic uh, dump of what you would tend to see from uh, Hubot plus a few extra commands. So we call our bot ROS bot, you know, ROS for radically open security. Okay, surprise. And some of these kinds of things uh, that are in here are, uh, are, are, you know, just sort of the generic uh, kinds of things. You can, you know, do, do really, you know, in, with these chatbots, you can do things from the useful to the completely silly, stupid, and pointless. And like all of it is great, you know? <laughs> so. For example, I mean, uh, generally, you know, so, some of the silly stuff is like, you know, I don't know, pug me and, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> just uh, various, uh, you know, uh, well, I, I think at one point uh, we uh, installed, uh, what was it, uh, Cards Against Humanity just for fun. But, uh, you know, <laughs> so you can do all that. That's, uh, that's cool. But, you know, ultimately you can do useful stuff with it too. And you can also see in this list, for example, that uh, we have uh, Rossbot uh, MD5, SHA, SHA1, SHA256. You know, that, that, those are sort of the range of uh, commands that actually start being functional and useful. So the nice thing about chat ops really is just that you have both. You know, in a way you can sort of combine the, uh, the conversation and the chatter and the culture, you know, with the actual functional work that you need to do. Now, another nice thing, nice thing about the chat ops is uh, the way that Radically Open Security works is we actually let our customers into our chat rooms to watch us while we're working. You know, this is, hence, hence the whole Radically Open, you know, part of, of the name of my company. So, uh, essentially what that means is, uh, you know, if a penetration tester or generally a team of them are working, they will actually converse with each other. And oftentimes, you know, the customer there being in the channel, it's really useful. Uh, it's useful, of course, for the uh, customer because they can actually watch, ask questions, learn. They can even steer things a little bit if they want to. Um, you know, we have a halfway evaluation point, so we can basically say, hey, yo, our scope is sort of halfway done, you know, how do you want us to prioritize things? But it's equally useful for us, you know, having the customer there, because they're basically like having an oracle in the channel. Because oftentimes, as a pen tester, some of the problems that you tend to have are things like uh, a system that isn't entirely working, or, you know, a server needs to be rebooted, or, you know, we want to understand a code path, or, you know, we just uh, have general, generic questions about, hey, you know, did I just create something on your file system? Could you look for me? So, you know, in that sense, having the customer there is actually really functional. So, and it's functional uh, both ways. Now, the nice thing then about with the chat ops is that as we're actually working and we're performing uh, operations via the chat bot in our chat rooms, the customer also can observe that. Because essentially when the uh, chat bot spits out its output, whether it's a, a compiled pen test report, for example, or scanner output, or you know, any number of things that you could script a bot to do, 
all of it really, again, is sort of open and transparent, <laughs> which ultimately, you know, in, in our opinion, kind of leads to a, a better pen test and also sort of a better interaction um, it, while we're doing it. So, um, we, for example, and this is all sort of part of our uh, chat up stuff, we wrote, uh, like many pen test companies, a XML, uh, well, pen test reporting automation system. Uh, of course, there's a few of them out there. Uh, you know, we basically rolled our own, uh, just one that worked for us. Uh, so the way that it works is we've got this thing. Um, well, we open sourced this whole this uh, suite. It's called uh, OWASP Pentext, and OWASP because we actually made it an OWASP project. So essentially, this is a framework that is uh, freely available for anyone to use. You know, again, sort of uh, well uh, under the OWASP umbrella. And the idea is, it's a document automation suite that actually follows the entire pen testing workflow. So it actually starts from um, the original request, the, uh, for example, a quotation request. It goes through scoping uh, you know, into essentially a, uh, well, a quotation. We can then go actually from the quotation to a bare bones report. Uh, we also interface with GitLab. Uh, so we kind of have a like holy trilogy of software that we use within Radically Open Security. It's mostly um, Rocket Chat, GitLab, and we also use Canboard extremely heavily uh, for uh, uh, our workflow. So, but uh, but the idea then is, uh, well, we can basically uh, yeah uh, we start with this thing called a quick scope. So essentially, uh, you can fill in a. Uh, A4's worth of XML. It compiles into a 13-page uh, quotation. The quotation, when you actually start a pen test, and again, all of this is controlled via the chat, right? <laughs> so uh, essentially, with the, uh, the quotation, the contents are basically copied over into a bare bones uh, uh, penetration test report. And then what we do is we use GitLab issues for actually uh, filling in uh, the details of, uh, for example, findings, non-findings, leads, uh, and future work. We have a script that can then actually convert from GitLab issues into XML. And then we can compile from the XML into a PDF. And the PDF is essentially the final, well, penetration test report. From there, we can actually go from the penetration test report to using the original information from the quotation to produce an invoice. So it's literally like, you know, from cradle to grave, we've got the entire process really streamlined and really automated. And we've open sourced it and we're giving it away. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but that's cool. So that's, it's called OWASP Pentext if anyone ever needs uh, anything similar. So, but uh, yeah, and, and you can sort of see in this example, this is an example of what uh, the XML uh, might look like. And then you compile it and essentially you would get something that looks somewhat like this. And uh, you can see then that, uh, well, you know, vulnerability ID type, threat level description, technical description, uh, and there's also recommendations. The uh, Pentex suite also automatically produces things like uh, summary tables, so summaries of findings, summaries of recommendations. Uh, these days, we actually also implemented some um, uh, uh, pie charts, so it can actually automatically generate pie charts also, depending on impact ratings and, uh, and the classification of the different types of vulnerabilities. So if you guys actually really cheaply uh, and fairly easily want to produce your own pen test reports, perhaps also based on your own scanner output and whatnot. Again, this is freely available and open source, so uh, feel free to check it out. Anyway, but uh, getting back, back to the whole chat ops bit, we uh, control that whole workflow via the chat. So you can see, for example, that uh, we have, for example, I have to say this is a bit of an old, uh, old uh, screenshot. It's, it's uh, depreciated by other commands by now. But uh, in this case, it was a raw spot shell command, PDF build, and then uh, the name of the customer, and then a pen test. And then what you see is it's actually uh, the bot is doing a clone from the, ex uh, from the uh, GitLab repository. Because basically, the, the pen testers are all using GitLab for their collaboration and uh, documentation and merging and everything. And then, uh, so it does a local clone, uses the uh, uh, tool chain essentially to compile it, and then it spits out a uh, PDF link that essentially anyone can click on to be able to then see the, uh, well, intermediate version that you're working on of the pen test report. Easy. 
Uh, in fact, uh, these days, yeah, this is a bit of an old screenshot because it's actually a lot le less verbose uh, now as well. We actually don't pr produce all the, well, print out all the intermediate stuff unless there's an error. So uh, most of the time now it's just compiled and then you just get the PDF link. So uh, that is easy. <laughs> so that is really easy. Um, and it's also easy for the customers, you know, that are just basically sitting there uh, observing. Um, similarly, uh, this is an example of uh, how things are structured in GitLab. So you can see in this case that, uh, you know, it's just a, kind of a standard repository, binaries, findings, non-findings, picks, report, scans, source templates, uh, things like that. So, yeah, so essentially, I mean, editing stuff is, you know, no more complicated than just uh, using Git. Uh, not to mention GitLab also has a, 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 a GUI as well that you can use if you have some less technical people on your team that aren't able to handle uh, command line Git. So it's, uh, it's pretty reasonable. So what else can you do with, uh, with chat ops in the pen testing area? So at one point in time, uh, together with uh, SEDN, uh, which is basically the owner of the .nl domain, we developed a passive scanning suite. So essentially what this is, is uh, combining the output of uh, Shodan and uh, scans.io, uh, and then essentially being able to, uh, well, uh, be able to say something, hopefully, about uh, potential vulnerabilities in a given uh, domain or IP address without actually actively poking at it. Uh, why would you want to do passive scanning instead of active scanning? Well, I mean, there's situations sometimes where you might not want to be seen or you might not want to, uh, or you might want to know basically what kind of recon can an, atta an attacker do without actually uh, sending a single packet uh, that hits your server. So we basically set that up, uh, again, also kind of, uh, you know, proof of concept. They actually wanted us to uh, do a scan of the uh, dot, uh, entire .nl domain. That was actually part of why we made it passive and not active, because we were like, dude, we can't do that without a waiver, and <laughs> we're not going to get a waiver from the entire .nl. So, <laughs> but, uh, so we wrote this uh, passive scan scanning suite. We also open sourced this. So this is in GitHub uh, for anyone who's interested. And uh, the nice thing really about this is you know, it's just another script that basically ties hacking tools together that, again, you can basically use Hubot to be able to tie in so you can launch this kind of stuff from the command line. So, you know, and, and honestly, the possibility of, like, the sheer number of hacking tools you could be able to launch, you know, from the command line, I mean, this kind of stuff gives you ideas. So, so another thing uh, that... Uh, chat ops makes possible is what we call red-blue pen testing. So red-blue pen testing is essentially the gamification of a customer's pen test. So what we do is we take, uh, well, uh, either, let's say, uh, developers or system administrators or DevOps people uh, that are working on uh, some particular system or, or piece of software uh, at a customer. Let's say there are, it's about a dozen people. We'll basically divide them into two teams, basically a red, red team and a blue team. And then what we will do is we'll usually take three days to a week to actually have them attack their own code. Okay? Under the guidance of two of our professional pen testers. So, you know, why is this cool? <laughs> well, the reason why this is cool is because... Um, you know, oftentimes if you're a pen test company, you're coming in as a, as a third party. You know, you're coming in as sort of a separate entity, and it's really easy for coders to feel threatened by what you're doing. You know, you come in and then you say, hey, there's problems with this and this and this, and they're like, no, there aren't. You know, it's a feature. <laughs> this isn't so bad. You know, and... <laughs> but, you know, on the other hand, if you actually... Uh, teach them enough about how to hack, and you can actually guide them. And, and you'd be surprised, actually, by how much stuff decent you know, coders, decent techies can actually find in, in a couple of days with the proper guidance. It changes the story. So no longer have uh, you know, the pen testers as a third party come in and found the problems, but now they found the problems themselves. So basically, what that means is now they're like, oh, you know, we found it ourselves. We're proud of this. So not only are you know are they you know not threatened by the fact that there's problems in their their own code, they're actually proud of themselves <laughs> for having found it. <laughs> you know, 
Um, you know, on top of that, uh, you know, it teaches them the mindset. It really embeds the mindset. And after really taking like three days to a week to sit, you know, in an attacker's shoes and you literally gamify it to, and you, we keep a scoreboard, you know, to provide, you know, a proper incentive and, uh, and motivation, you know, after spending a week playing hacker, the number one comment that we get at the end of these exercises is, uh, I'm never going to look at coding the same way again. You know, and that's exactly what it's about. <laughs> you know, so on top of that, you, you do tend to get a quite complete uh, pen test report out of it as well, just due to the fact that there's so many eyes and brains looking at it at the same time. And of course, a dozen developers can find more stuff in a week than two of my own pen testers can. That's just how it is, because you have more people looking. So, you know, in a way, it's sort of combining a pen test with the training. You know, it actually, at the end of the day, doesn't cost that much more than a normal, normal pen test either because, uh, well, I mean, essentially, it's only costing two, pen, two of my pen testers' time <laughs> to facilitate the whole thing. You know, but at the end of the day, you know, what makes this possible? Chat ops. <laughs> you know, because we can let uh, these customers, you know, into these chat rooms. Basically, each team has their own chat room. You know, we can maintain the scoreboard, and you can actually see right here uh, how that works. You see now, uh, for example, uh, well, one of the pen testers was saying a point for blue for finding missing input validation. Um, and then we put good job blue. And then you can see that uh, raw spots has incremented blue 24 points. And then it prints out some motivational, you know, <laughs> graphic, you know, just like that. And, uh, you know, it really makes things, you know, exciting and entertaining, you know, and ultimately, you know, I think as, you know, security people, what we ultimately want to do is embed that mindset into the developers. Because if, you know, you know, if you can't succeed in doing that, <laughs> you, know, it, you know, just a pen test isn't going to get you there. So, but yeah. But, all right. But there's all kinds of other things, <laughs> you know, that we also uh, can implement, uh, you know, some of which also, um, much of which we actually have implemented already. So, in terms of uh, pen testing, Scanning and exploitation. So Nmap, for example, we have already implemented uh, essentially a bot command that runs Nmap. It snips out the appropriate parts from the Nmap output. It converts that into XML, and then it basically puts it in the correct place in GitLab so it compiles into the PDF automatically. You know, and you launch this from the chat. That's cool. <laughs> you know. And again, it's the kind of thing, it's responsive, you can see it immediately after you do it, you know, really neat stuff. There's other things that uh, we could implement, we haven't actually gotten around to it yet, but uh, I envision, th uh, you know, things like web application scanners like W3AF, uh, SQL map is also an obvious one, brute forcing passwords using things like Hydra, you know, that's an easy one. Uh, you know, this kind of stuff, you know, what's stopping us? <laughs> uh, one thing, actually, speaking of password cracking, we actually already have implemented uh, a rainbow table. <laughs> well, uh, and uh, we also are using that. Uh, and that's actually really cool, because, again, you have to have basically the rainbow tables on a, on a back end server somewhere. And then you can use the chat as a front end for being able to, to query that. Of course, take some time to set up and prepare, of course, creating the rainbow tables and, and finding a suitable place to store them. But again, it's, it's giving that really nice front end <laughs> to, uh, you know, uh, well, a, a very commonly, you know, occurring and an extremely useful thing that you would do during pen tests. All right, uh, other things that you can use it for, so uh, recon, so uh, certainly things like who is uh, Google. I already mentioned the passive scanning uh, tool uh, that we wrote. You know, but the sky's the limit, I and mean, there's more stuff you can come up with. Similarly, also exploitation, uh, hash cracking. We also give some, uh, some trainings and workshops, and uh, I have one particular training that we give that's actually a password uh, training. It, it's, it's fairly basic. It's just meant for people to understand why, you know, uh, secret one, two, three is actually not a good, uh, <laughs> a good password. And, and what happens is we have also uh, created basically a... Uh, emulator as well as uh, putting John the Ripper and then we basically hung them both on on the chat <laughs> so what happens is during the workshop we actually get workshop participants to shout out passwords 
you know, and then I'll send you, I'll put that in, you know, uh, into the chat, and then you can actually watch <laughs> while it's being cracked. And again, I mean, this is actually really great stuff for a workshop <laughs> that you can do interactively with your participants, facilitated by chat ops. Cool. So, all right, other things uh, that we have implemented, spear phishing. So we also created a uh, spear phishing suite, also uh, open sourced. <laughs> Almost everything, by the way, that we create, we, we open source, and that, that's also one of the other core principles of my company. But uh, so the spear phishing suite is actually, actually really cool. What it does is you can put in uh, the URL of a web page, and then it automatically scrapes that web page, and then it turns it into a phishing mail. You can then create a distribution list of uh, targets, as it were, uh, that you want to email essentially that uh, pretext to. And, and well, it, essentially it's uh, sort of stored and grouped by, uh, by pretext name. And then after the, uh, so, so you use one uh, chat ops command to do the scraping. You use one chat ops command to do the, uh, well, the launching of the emails, so the deployment to the emails. And then the great thing is, and this is so much fun with customers, is you can actually let the customers into the chat room. And we've basically got hooks uh, on our web server that if it gets a hit from a particular pretext, we can actually see who clicked on that, you know, who clicked on the mail, what IP address did they come from, which pretext was it, and timestamp. So literally the customer can sit there watching in the chat room in real time as their own employees are clicking on phishing mails. Cool. <laughs> you know, courtesy of chat ops. <laughs> you know, and, and yes, we've open sourced this as well. Um, you know, there's other things also uh, that uh, we're using chat ops for, and it's a little less security specific, but it's more just uh, related to running a business and our, our daily operations. But we still use chat ops so heavily, you know, for our workflow these days for almost everything. You know, things like project management, for example. As you can imagine, you know, with a, a security consultancy company, at a certain point you start getting so many requests from so many different places, it's a whole challenge to uh, keep it organized. Like many DevOps organizations, we've embraced uh, Kanban uh, for our workflow and uh, for trying to track it and optimize it and all that good stuff. We use the Kanboard open source software uh, as our Kanban board. Uh, and what we've done is we have actually implemented really cool stuff, like for example, hooks between Rocket Chat and our CAN board. <laughs> so for example, I'm not sure if you guys uh, are familiar with uh, the Ship It Squirrel. Uh, so Ship It Squirrel is, is essentially this, uh, yeah, it's sort of like a little funny thing that uh, if you, yeah, and, and I guess a lot of DevOps organizations, if you do some kind of deployment or release or something, then you go ship it and then you get the squirrel. It's just, it's completely silly. But, you know, it's just kind of a fun way of celebrating that, yay, we just shipped something. You know, we do exactly the same thing, you know, for both our quotations and our pen test reports. But, just for fun, we actually tied in the Ship It Squirrel with our CAN board. So basically, when somebody invokes the Ship It Squirrel, it actually moves the item on the CAN board to done. Cool, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You know, and, and this is the kind of stuff that you can sort of implement uh, with, uh, with chat ops. You know, other things, of course, for a consultancy company that are useful for us to know is sort of like, you know, which requests are there, you know, uh, you know and, and really, you know, it, of course it's a work in progress and we're continually improving it, but sort of, you know, chat ops questions that you want the bot to be able to ask are things like, uh, what, you know, what is, the, what is the availability of my pen testers? Or, you know, uh, which... Uh, quotations are ready for review, or which pen test reports are ready for review, or, you know, who is available, who's good at, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, buffer overflows and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and some, some programming language, you know. And the, the nice thing is, I mean, if you can write, you know, some kind of script or, you know, or program to be able to answer these questions, then you can just hook it up to the chat, and it really saves a lot of work. We've also on the CAN board, for example, we have uh, idle reminders. So essentially once every uh, week, the, uh, uh, we get basically in the chat a uh, list of, okay, these are the CAN board items that have been idle. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it used to be that a person manually had to run through the CAN board to actually see which things were idle. Now we just get these reminders in the chat, <laughs> you know, so the person doesn't even have to bother and doesn't have to go there to look. Awesome, you know? 
other things that we, uh, we've developed uh, uh, chat ops wise. So y there's this thing uh, that we call uh, Git notes. So we uh, have a lot of email correspondence with customers, as one would imagine, as most companies do. So we considered at the beginning using some kind of a help desk uh, solution. So we looked at things like uh, OTRS, for example. Uh, didn't entirely work for us. I mean, just uh, in how difficult it was to set up and, and, and difficult, uh, difficulty of customizing it. Of course, there's some great commercial solutions, but you know, we're radically open security. We use open source more or less in principle for everything. So uh, you know, that also, you know, the commercial solu solutions weren't acceptable for us. So what we did is we essentially set up a uh, mechanism that if uh, somebody, uh, and we basically call it Git notes, if, if somebody either ca carbon copies or blind carbon copies a particular email address. So we create these triads, which are essentially triads of uh, Rocket Chat channel name, GitLab repo name, Canboard item. So this triad of these three, three names, generally the names are inconsistent, are consistent. Not, not necessarily always, but, uh, but basically the triad has a name. So if you send an email to triad name at, you know, uh, git notes dot whatever, whatever, you know, <laughs> then basically what happens is it will actually automatically shoot a copy of that email into GitLab. <laughs> and then it will actually, there's hooks into the Rocket Chat channel for that same job. <laughs> so basically, you actually get an announcement in the channel that you just got email correspondence with subject name this, you know, with this timestamp, click here to open it in GitLab. <laughs> so essentially, we kind of created our own, uh, well, uh, well, uh, yeah, CRM system, kind of, you know, our help desk system. Uh, but then, you know, using these hooks so that everything is visible. And the really cool thing is customers actually really like it. And you'd think, why would customers want to see their own correspondence? But actually, they do. Because, uh, for example, we're working with one big customer. And uh, we're getting a lot of smaller requests from them. But there's basically two uh, managers that are slightly higher up. And they basically just said, well, we want to be carbon copied on all the correspondence because we want to know what's going on. So I basically just said, hey, well, just join this chat room and you guys can actually see everything as it goes on. So basically with zero extra effort, I can actually loop them in into the totality of correspondence. <laughs> you know, really cool. And another nice thing also that we've implemented is for example, uh, being able to create uh, new Rocket Chat channels. Uh, well, basically create entire new triads, I should say. So new Rocket Chat channel, GitLab repo, and Canboard item. And we've created hooks so we can invoke this via the email. So I don't need, you know, <laughs> and we can also do it via the chat, but, uh, you know, <laughs> but I mean, it's basically using the same API. But, uh, but it's actually super cool because it's really just streamlining stuff that even like for my cell phone, I can basically, you know, do relatively complex, <laughs> you know, operations just by basically forwarding an email. And at the same time, everybody's getting like real time announcements of this stuff in the chat room as it's happening. Really cool, <laughs> you know, <laughs> really optimized, really transparent. So, and we've put a lot of, of course, time and effort into implementing this kind of stuff. Um, another thing, we're, we're a consultancy company, so billable hours is kind of a thing for us. You know, that, that's how we make money. That's how we keep our doors open. We, right now, have implemented via the chat ops a command uh, called a raw spot charge. So, uh, if a... Uh, Pen tester is working, like let's say they worked uh, seven hours today. They can just go raw spot charge seven. <laughs> and then raw spot says, okay, thank you. And then, uh, it, it, and then basically that's stored in the database. So that's how the consultants log their hours. Easy. <laughs> You know, and, and it's, it's easy enough that it's actually a way that consultants don't really complain about it either. <laughs> you know, and they don't even need to necessarily say which job they're logging the hours on either because it's basically corresponding to the channel name that they type it in. <laughs> you know, nice. And, and essentially, I mean, uh, we're, well, we're still developing s stuff, but of course, uh, it's our intention to basically take then that data and create really nice uh, business metrics with it uh, so we can eventually be able to make B better analytics and better business decisions. That kind of stuff is still a work in progress, but, uh, but of course collecting the data is, uh, is step one. So other questions. Uh, well, geez, I mean, you know, th this is an awful lot of comments. You don't want your customers messing around with that, you know, because <laughs> of course they're in our chat rooms too. 
So we have implemented role-based access control for these, uh, for these commands. So for example, we have users in our system divided up into, for example, uh, raw staff, uh, customers, uh, R&D staff, admin, <laughs> yeah, you have that too, you know, that, that kind of stuff. And we even have roles for individual customers. Because, for example, those two managers that I mentioned from the other customer, they basically said, well, we want you to add us to all correspondence for every single new, uh, you know, channel that's created for our company. Well, we can basically create this list of these are the people that are automatically added, you know, <laughs> when you create a, a new triad, you know, and in such a way, I get, it's creating a role and then it makes sure that, that people who are, correspond to that role are sort of automatically included you know, when you're doing these commands. You know, and it also makes sure that customers, for example, aren't able to uh, invoke the commands to create new triads. <laughs> you know, also, uh, it might not be appropriate for them to uh, perform scanning from our servers, for example. You know, we've got role-based access control on that stuff. You know, so uh, yeah, th that's also pretty cool. And it's also, of course, uh, completely necessary. Of course, a prerequisite for RBAC actually working is uh, making sure there's no larger vulnerabilities. And I have to say, we've also worked a little bit with the Rocket Chat team as well and reported a couple of vulns, which they, they have quite promptly fixed. <laughs> you know? So of course, we're also uh, auditing the security of our own uh, solution, including the, uh, the RBAC uh, that we're building. Another thing that uh, we've created are logging, it's basically error and logging channels. So we've got one channel uh, right now in our chat room that is basically nothing other than uh, server error logs. So basically, uh, if something goes wrong with some of the uh, code that we're building, because of course, at this point, it's quite, a, quite an R&D project we have going, you know, and, and, and things regularly break. I mean, you don't even have to leave the chat environment to see the error logs. Basically, the, the guys that are working on doing the R&D, all they have to do is just look in the error log channel, you know, <laughs> and uh, they see it immediately. So that's really handy. Uh, similarly, also with the uh, like Git notes that I was describing before, we've also got a, a complete log of that, <laughs> you know, which basically just provides debug output. I mean, only the R&D guy is in the channel, <laughs> you know. I mean, we obviously don't want to spam everybody with that kind of stuff. But the idea is, because it's divided up into chat rooms, you can essentially only add the relevant people to that relevant, you know, that particular chat room, which basically means that you know the people who need to see something can, and the people who don't want to see something or who shouldn't see something don't. So yeah, it, it's, it's pretty handy with that. Other things uh, that we're implementing right now, uh, we just like a week ago uh, had uh, included basically a new help menu uh, that we'd built. So that long dump that I showed you before, I said it was uh, depreciated actually. N nowadays actually, if there is gonna be a log dump, it's actually sent to a direct message uh, from the chatbot, <laughs> just so the, uh, the help output, so, uh, so large dumps don't like, spam the entire channel. <laughs> well, one of the problems with chat ups, of course, uh, for, and anybody who knows, who uses Slack will understand, is what we call chat dust. You know, <laughs> at a certain point that, you know, you, sometimes you just get some disruptive stuff or there's too much noise to signal. And of course, we're always conscious of trying to make, you know, the signal to noise ratio higher. So for example, yeah, taking help out, help output dumps and sending it to DMs instead of, uh, putting it in the channel, that kind of stuff. And we've also created sort of a three-layer uh, help menu that essentially you can, it's sort of like a man page that you can basically just like get a list of categories and then a command and then sort of drill down. And you can do all that basically without bothering other people uh, in the chat. So this is also, uh, you know, stuff that uh, we've been implementing and that we're pretty far along with. And sort of looking towards the future with like what other kinds of things that I think we can implement, you know, the sky's the limit. You know, one thing that really interests me a whole lot is uh, AI. You know, there's, it's kind of hip these days, you know, talking about things like AI chatbots. But the question is, how could you take that and then apply that to uh, the domain of security and penetration testing, or even just, you know, with the operations of your company? Th think about normal corporate processes like onboarding. Right? You know, I mean, onboarding new personnel always takes uh, a lot of effort. Now, imagine if you actually had some kind of a chat bot that could actually help out with the onboarding of new staff members, you know, in the chat channel. <laughs> and essentially, you could create some list of uh, sort of uh, predefined questions or, you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, even thinking of it sort of as like a, a choose your own adventure story, you know, kind of script, you know, or interaction that you'd be able to have with the thing. 
you know, how, much, how many real man hours could that save, <laughs> you know, and having this automated option available. But the nice thing about a chat bot is, you know, I mean, everybody, of course, gets really annoyed by automated systems because it's not human and it's not personal. But if it's happening in the chat room, if personal interaction is required, people are there. <laughs> so you can actually let the majority of uh, you know, the interaction happen with the bot. And then if, if something happens that's surprising or unusual, then of course a human can always jump in and you know, try and get some more information or try and give some more explanation. Same thing with like, for example, uh, we haven't implemented this yet, but it's on my to-do list. Implementing essentially, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, 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 questionnaires, basically, customer satisfaction uh, surveys at the end. Of course, everybody hates automated you know, <laughs> uh, customer satisfaction surveys. But the thing is, if you could use a chat bot, for example, uh, to be able to feed that uh, to a customer directly at the end of a job, you know, if the customer gives a surprising answer, you would have a person in that channel <laughs> who then can you know, start asking more detailed questions or asking for some explanations. So in a way, it's kind of, you know, I think, the best of both worlds in that you can sort of offboard some of that stuff to a bot to make your operations more efficient, but you still have the personal touch because the people are there. You know, and to me, that's kind of like you know, the promise of chat ops. And the best thing about this is it's completely online. You know, you can do this from anywhere. <laughs> you know, I mean, literally, I have pen testers all over the globe, Australia, Latin America, all, all across Europe, uh, you know, India. You know, I've, I've, I've got staff all over the place. I've got people who travel full time and who spend like their entire lives like just pet sitting people's houses, <laughs> you know. And you can live that lifestyle if you want to, if you're a location independent company. Similarly, also to working your own hours. It also actually, at, at the end of the day, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I think it makes for a really comfortable workplace, you know. <laughs> So I think that we're reasonably unique in, uh, in what we do. And Radically Open Security is three years old now, and I just want to mention sort of at the end that uh, a lot of people actually have uh, been considering what we're doing extremely innovative. And we've won quite a number of uh, awards uh, for what we've done with our workflow, with our openness and transparency, with our business model. This is just a selection. I mean, the uh, Dutch Chamber of Commerce uh, named us the 50th most innovative SME in the Netherlands. I'm proud of that. Um, similarly, uh, you know, I'm in the Inspiring 50 uh, for the last two years, uh, which is just a, well, women in tech thing. Um, you know, that our, we have a NetAid kit project, which is uh, this open source uh, router thing. It's one of our R&D projects, but that's won a few awards. So. Uh, Sprout Challenger 50 is, Sprout is just a Dutch, uh, it, uh, what's it called, uh, entrepreneurship uh, magazine that also called us one of the 50 most challenging uh, startups in the Netherlands, even though we're not really a startup anymore. But, uh, and finally, not too long ago, uh, also uh, CIO magazine actually named me the most innovative leader <laughs> in the Netherlands for this year. So anyway, but not saying that to toot my own horn, but I'm just saying that we're getting a hell of a lot of recognition right now uh, for what we're doing, and a lot of people appreciate it. Uh, so uh, I hope that what I've told you guys today is thought-provoking. I hope that it's inspiring, and I hope that you guys can think about how chat ops might be able to work within your own organizations. Thank you. So uh, does anybody have any questions? Hello, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, uh, congratulations for the for the talk. I think it's it's great and really inspirational. Cool. And I think even like a separate talk on your business model and financial scheme, it would be a great talk in a startup uh, conference. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I wanted to ask is regarding all these uh, cool and automated processes you have implemented. And you know, sometimes, especially when you work with the pressure of clients in consultancies or in any other company mm -hmm. I, I've worked, you know, there's always this thing, it's, there's never the time, the budget for doing all these things and stuff. So yep. what's the secret? What's uh, the secret? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, what's the secret? So I don't really think there is a secret. It's, it's just a matter of prioritization. <laughs> I mean, look, we're, we're, we're not a rich company. You know, I mean, we, uh, we, we're bootstrapped. Uh, we were offered venture capital, and I turned it down just because I didn't want to give up any control over, uh, over what I was, the company I was building. Um, 
what that means is, of course, we have to be very careful in how we spend our money, and we have to be very careful in you know, how we prioritize what we're going to work on. That being said, uh, it is so expensive to not automate. You know, and this is sort of one of the lessons that I've learned, you know, in, in well, with this company. For example, uh, writing quotations. Once upon a time, when I first started the company, it took us a week to write a quotation. Now, you know, presuming we have the, inf we know what the customer wants, it takes us a half hour. You know, the amount of, ca the, the amount of cash savings that is, because ultimately, if you're a consultant. C company and you're working with freelancers that you pay by the hour, any time, you know, time is money. <laughs> and anything that you can do to save time saves money. And, and, you know, yes, it means that you need to have some upfront investment. That's definitely true. So you actually need to dare to create this tooling <laughs> in the first place. But, you know, a month or two after you create it, all of a sudden you start seeing just in your margins <laughs> you know, that, that investment coming back to you. You know, and nowadays, thankfully, I mean, our buffers are starting to get a little bit bigger than they used to be in the past. But, uh, I mean, all of this stuff pays itself back hundredfold. <laughs> so it's just a matter of, I think, just having the, the longer term, you know, vision for it. And, uh, you know, and the other, uh, the other thing also is that I've learned is uh, the absolute most boring... <laughs> So the absolute most boring tasks, you know, I, I used to give them to non-technical people because, like, for example, things like writing quotations and uh, editing reports, you know, I used to think, oh, pen testers would get really bored by that. I'm just not going to ask them. But what wound up happening was the non-techies would essentially work on it. They'd do it once, they'd do it twice, they'd do it three times, they'd be like, man, this is boring, and then they'd get demotivated and then eventually leave. <laughs> you know, I gave exactly the same task then to a coder, <laughs> and then the coder did it once, did it twice, did it the third time. Then the coder said, man, this is boring, I can automate this. <laughs> and then he did. <laughs> or actually, well, she did. <laughs> actually, the, the person who wrote Pentext was actually, uh, most of Pentext was female. So, uh, but, but nonetheless, and, and that's sort of the difference. So nowadays, even for the most boring routine things, you know, I try to put as hardcore of a techie as I can find, you know, on it, especially one that can code well. And, you know, the great thing is, you know, no matter what it is that you're doing, whether it's report writing or creating invoices or pen testing, you're always going to have some repetitive stuff. And it's not that much more effort to automate it, <laughs> you know, than to actually perform it manually a few times. And just generally over time, that's how we have created our body of code. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Hey. Um, you said you give away a decent uh, part of your company's income to charity. Yes. So what is the area of the charity? Is it related to security? I mean, what, what is it about? Yeah. OK. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, so. Uh, this is the business model spiel. So uh, we're set up as something called a fiscal fundraising institution for uh, the NLNet Foundation. So NLNet is a uh, foundation in the Netherlands that has uh, given, well, they're basically like a subsidy uh, grant, well, like a grant age funding agency. So they uh, have given money the last 15 years uh, to things like, uh, you know, the EFF and GNU and Tor and Jitsi and GPL and academic research and basically a DNS sec and, and essentially anything for a better internet. Uh, th those here in the Netherlands probably have heard of NLNet. Uh, they're, they're, at least in the Netherlands, a somewhat uh, well-known uh, <laughs> entity. We have no direct relations in as such with NLNet. We're not part of them or anything like that. We're independent. But I b chose NLNet as our charity, you know, just, uh, well, uh, because it seemed the easiest way of being able to show that we would give back to the community. I do want to clarify that point, though. As a fiscal fundraising institution, we're giving 90% of our profits to charity, not 90% of our turnover. <laughs> That's a, an important point to make because uh, we need our turnover, of course, to, to run the company. <laughs> so another thing also, full transparency, you know, we're a three-year-old scale up right now, so we're also still not incredibly profitable <laughs> yet. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> but, you know, so uh, I, I have to say that as well. So uh, right, right now, most of the profits, of course, are reinvested just in building the vehicle of the company. 
At the same time, though, we're also using the vehicle of the company to do things like uh, nonprofit pro bono jobs. So we do, for example, uh, incident response um, on a nonprofit basis for NGOs and civil society groups <laughs> uh, that can't go anywhere else, you know. And uh, also, uh, well, this net aid kit project that we've built, and uh, so we, we do a number of nonprofit projects as well. So you know, we're trying to kind of build an ideal organization that gives back uh, instead of just taking. So anyway, thanks. I think there was another question. Mm -hmm. Hey, hello, thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned that the password secure one, two, three is not good any anymore. Does that mean I have to change all my passwords? <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, uh, the question is, um, you mentioned the red blue pen testing. Um, I think that this is a really good idea to introduce to the dev teams, uh, developers. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any recipes, any scenarios that we could use in our company to, to just you know, introduce it? Right. So how do you introduce red blue pen testing into your own company? Um, I don't think that you need specific recipes, but it's just a matter of uh, being able to uh, get uh, developers attacking their own products. I mean, that, that's essentially the recipe. That's the scenario. So if you have people that are working on a website, have them attack their own website. If they're building a product, have them attack their own product. If it's an infrastructure team, have them attack their own infrastructure. You could, if you're feeling a bit saucy, you know, actually have them uh, attack each other's <laughs> products. So you could have you know, maybe a product team attack the infrastructure and the infrastructure team attack the product. I mean, if you want to, hey, you could do that as well. But uh, you know, before the rest, of course, you need to facilitate the process with uh, some folks that know what they're doing. Because if you just uh, you know drop the developers in there without giving them some amount of background, of course, they'll uh, they'll flounder. So you know, for for uh, techies that are relatively security aware already, not mu that much of an introduction is needed. For techies that really don't have the security background, we also in the past have given uh, basically like a three-day. Uh, like OWASP top 10, you know, hands-on hacking training prior to the red blue pen test, so they could actually hit the ground running when the red blue pen test started. So th those kinds of things are options. So. Yeah. All right. Are there any other questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your uh, time and attention. So.